Hello, listeners. This is episode seven of RFA Insider. That was Eugene. I'm Amy, and today we have an extra special episode of RFA Insider in honor of Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Oh, that was a mouthful. That's right. We have two extra special guests to help us with this extra special quest. And first up on the rundown, we have a fun down with a panel discussion that will give you a fax concussion all about Asian American representation in the media of the U.S. nation. Um, okay, well, I'm not going to wrap, but on how it's made, the panel will discuss how we made it as Asian American journalists, how our parents felt about our chosen career field, and where we'd like to see more improvement in the state of Asian Americans in journalism. All of that and more with our guests Charlie and Boer. Very nice rhyming, Eugene. <laughs> but then we've got an action-packed show for you today, so stay tuned. You're listening to the RFA Insider Podcast, made by two real-life staffers at Radio Free Asia. If you'd like to send us feedback, there are many ways you can do this. You can send us an email at insider at rfa.org. You can comment on our webpage at rfa.org slash English slash insider. Just click on the episode you're listening to and write your comment below. Or you can send us a tweet at RFA Insider or visit us in person. No, don't visit us in person. Right, don't visit us in person. But anyway, we really want to hear from you. So tune in every other Friday and we'll take you behind the scenes. And tell you what the news really means here at RFA Insider. Okay, so welcome back to RFA Insider. Here in the seventh episode, we wanted to do things a little bit differently. So yes, Radio Free Asia does provide news about Asian countries where press freedom is lacking, but it is AANHPI month, and many of us here at Radio Free Asia across all of the services are Asian Americans, or at least Asians living in the U.S., so it doesn't really seem right that we weren't going to do anything at all as an organization for this. So uh, we would simply like to highlight the AANHPI community, but of course... As always, let's start this episode with a little Podcast Free Asia. That's right. And today on Podcast Free Asia, we'll briefly introduce our two guests, Charlie Darapak and Bora Deng, two awesome people who have made a huge impact on RFA since they arrived on the scene. Okay. So first, it'll be my pleasure to introduce Charlie Darapak, also known as Chuck D., and he's RFA's Multimedia Managing Director. And prior to working at RFA, Charlie spent more than two decades doing photojournalism at the Associated Press, after which he worked at several other outlets, including a stint at Meta. Thank you, Eugene. Thank you, Amy, for having me. Um, yep, I'm the Multimedia Managing Editor here at RFA. Um, it says here to talk about your background a bit. Okay, <laughs> I am experimenting with new approaches to storytelling for RFA to reach audiences in countries with restrictive media environments and also res um, reach audiences who wouldn't necessarily be interested in uh, APAC news. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty much what I do, and I'm having a great time. All right. Well, thank you for joining us today. And, of course, I wanted to say that the reason that RFA Insider even exists at all is because of Charlie, because he stalked my LinkedIn profile and found out that I used That's to produce true. a podcast <laughs> as a hobby. That's true. That's and true. then he approached me about doing one, and we went back and forth with ideas, and this is the result. Yes. That's true. Thank you, Eugene uh, and Amy, for, for running with this, really. Um, you know, I enjoy planting the seeds and, uh, and providing the support. You know, I, w I want you both to have fun. With, uh, with this podcast, and I, and I see that you're both having fun with it. So so I'm really happy, and, and thanks for having me today. Yeah, thank you. And also, Charlie uh, listens to every episode before we publish it to tell us what we have to take out. <laughs> <laughs> I won't have to listen today. <laughs> All right. All right. And also joining us today is investigative team director Bora Deng. Um, Bora has come to RFA after making a name for herself in several UK-based media outlets, and now her team is making serious waves at RFA. Thank you guys so much for having me. Um, oh, I'm also supposed to talk about myself now. Um, no, it's been such a pleasure. Um, I'm so grateful and really been really excited to um, have gotten to lead this new team, much like Charlie leading a new unit. Um, we started in 2023, and I actually think you guys had two of our correspondents on the show very recently talking about a story that we did. Um, and in addition to doing our own reporting within our unit, we also work with a lot of the services, work with Charlie and his team all the time, obviously, um, to bring some of the excellent reporting that all of our colleagues are doing in different languages to anyone who's interested in reading or viewing or consuming news and 
um, interesting stories about Asia in English. Your uh, your team is actually the first to have two appearances on this podcast, so congratulations. Um, <laughs> oh, oh, no, I definitely hope this isn't the last one. Then. <laughs> no, there no will it be def- more. definitely won't be. <laughs> so let's get on with this episode, starting with The Rundown. The Rundown. All right, on this special edition of The Rundown, we're going to put our heads together to make a top five list of Asian American characters in TV and movies from our youths. So we're looking for positive portrayals that avoid many of the Asian character tropes, such as the nerdy scientist, the female love interest for the white male main character, the martial artist, the socially inept loser, the sinister villain, and the sidekick for the white main character. Prior to starting this exercise, though, I'd like to discuss when and how we came to the realization that there is or that there isn't a representation problem. So let's start with Amy. All right. So I grew up in the South in the 2000s, and I think I had a very Disney Channel childhood. So it wasn't surprising to see Asian characters, oh, the laughing, in like popular TV shows. But of course, they were always, you know, the sidekick or the side characters. Um, But more so than TV shows or movies, I was way more invested in the boy bands of the time. So Jonas Brothers, One Direction, And I would religiously watch all of their music videos, you know, their TV shows, their tour vlogs. And at some point, I realized they weren't singing about girls who look like me. And that's kind of how I got into K-pop. I think, um, shout out to Asian media, but (laughs) (laughs) I was always the Asian girl or like the Asian one and everywhere in my life. So it felt very freeing to have something in which I could just be a girl without any modifiers attached. Hey, so like I think that's a lot of a lot of the reason that a lot of people do go to like K-pop or other for sure other medias is because they feel underrepresented with the media that in, in the U.S. At least among Asian Americans that I've heard. Yeah, say. and like even K-pop itself is made up of so many Asian Americans. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, this was also around the time when YouTube was just born, so Asian American creators like Wong Fu Productions oh, I love were that. producing like short films, skits, music videos. And some of their stuff was comedy about the experience of growing up Asian American, like especially with immigrant parents. Mm-hmm. But other productions were just about like love or like growing up. And the only difference was that they had leads or love interests of Asian descent. So I guess it only became clear to me that there was a representation problem after tasting the like uh, possibilities, right. so to speak. Right. Let's move along to Charlie. All How right. about you? So, so for me, I'm, I'm a 70s born Gen Xer who watched most of my TV in the mid-1980s, you know, mostly reruns of shows that were produced in the 1970s. So looking at that period of time now, yeah, there weren't hardly any real-life Asians or Asian characters on TV in movies or or even commercials, although I do remember that (laughs) that commercial uh, with the tagline, Ancient Chinese Secret. How do you get shirts so clean, Mr. Lee? Ancient Chinese secret. Yes. Um, I actually don't remember what that commercial was trying to sell. This it was a laundry it, detergent. It wasn't an ancient Chinese secret? No, Sorry. <laughs> not, not, not really. <laughs> the, the, the guy in the commercial was uh, was an Asian laundromat owner, I yes. think. Yeah. He's not even really dry cleaning the clothes. He's just sticking it in the washing. So, you know, I, when it comes to representation in, 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 of Asians in media, like during that time, there wasn't much. So, but I can't say it really bothered me. Um, my sister and I went to public school in suburban New York City, uh, Staten Island to be specific. And the only other Asians in my class in, in grade school, and I can still remember their names, uh, George Chang, who was Taiwanese, Paul De Los Reyes, who was Filipino, and, and I was Thai. You know, so there were maybe three or four families in Staten Island where I grew up that were Thai. Um, my sister and I worked in the first Thai restaurant there. So, oh, wow. Yeah, so already I was used to being in a very small group of Asians and even a smaller subgroup of Thais um, in my school. It was it was my sister and and, uh, and two cousins. So for me, there was no expectation for representation or to see Asians on TV or in the movies um, at that time. Uh, I guess I can talk a little bit about Bruce Lee. So this was during mm. the Kung Fu craze of the 70s and the 80s. And, uh, you know, my mom went and enrolled me in the YMCA for judo lessons. And I remember being the smallest kid there and <laughs> and the only Asian kid there. And I was being thrown around by by bigger by bigger uh, white kids. And, you know, so that didn't last very long. I moved on to tennis after that. But um, <laughs> so, so the thing with Bruce Lee um, yeah. and Eugene, you and I were talking about this uh, before the yeah. show, you know, I don't really see him as solving a representation problem. Well, I mean, that's not the purpose of his movies, of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah. You know, for me, and I guess for many Asians, like, he represented strength and someone who couldn't be pushed around, per se, right. maybe. And, you know, I, I mean, it's natural 
growing up in the the New York City public school system, I I was bullied for being Asian. You know, I, I was yeah. bullied on the bus. You know, I was called uh, Chink or Ching Chong, and you know. But as Bruce Lee said, and I actually heard this much later, not not at the mm. time. You know, he said he said, "Be like water." Now you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Now water can flow, or it can crash. Be water, my friend. So you know, <laughs> which which he gets from from Lao Lao Tzu, right? I, I don't know where yeah. the quote comes from, yeah. but the point is, you should be adaptable to every situation. Yeah. So this this stuff kind of like slid off me, and and I think uh, growing up as a, a Thai Buddhist, you know, that that also helped a lot. Okay. Uh, so since you brought up Bruce Lee and uh, we're talking about representation, I think one of the most visible faces on TV here in the Washington, D.C. area that was Asian when I was growing up was uh, Jun Ri, who was a, a Taekwondo um, master. But he was actually friends with Bruce Lee, and they taught each other a lot of stuff. So, um, But, yeah, if you if you lived in the D.C. area, area between uh, maybe 1975 and 1990, it was always this jingle that you'd hear. Nobody bothers me. Nobody bothers me. Call USA 1000. June re means right for right. Nobody buys me. Nobody buys me. Either. He was so, selling. He was selling a course. So he was selling his. Oh, he gym? had like a, a whole chain of um of like Taekwondo studios. Ah. And it was called Junri Self Defense. But anyway, for me. The time that I realized that there was a representation problem was around, around the time that I saw the movie Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. And that movie came out in 1984, but I didn't actually see it until 1991 because uh, McDonald's was selling it in a promotion that, that year. Um, so the film opens up immediately. It's got this blonde bombshell, Kate Capshaw, who's a good actress, but she's been made to sing Anything Goes. But she's singing it in Chinese, but she doesn't speak Chinese, and it's very obvious. Good to and then uh, from there, her, there's dancers in the background, and they're wearing um, rice hats and black hair wigs. And it just goes downhill. Indiana Jones is talking to these um, Chinese gangsters who betray him and poison him, and then he has to get rescued by this this sidekick kid played by Ke Hai Kwan who is called Shorty for the rest of the film, and he speaks in a thick accent. And I actually do like this character. It's just that, you know, any of his lines were then repeated by my classmates to make fun of Asian people. Um, yes. But I do yes. like the role. I do like the role. It was, it was really good. And, and even though they're problematic, it's, it's a bit problematic in that he was the sidekick and not really the main character. Um, after that, they travel to exotic India that's really Sri Lanka, and they are uh, shocked by, quote-unquote, Indian food, but... The men on the menu is living snakes and giant beetles and eyeball soup that looks exceptionally like human eyeballs. Um, monkey brains served still in the monkey's head. Chilled a monkey brain. And then they rescue an entire village full of children kidnapped by a witch doctor who drinks blood and rips people's still beating hearts out of their chests in sacrifice to an oh actual Hindu God. deity. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I did enjoy this film a lot, and I still watch it today, but I'm coming from a context where I know that this is supposed to be fantasy and none of that stuff is real. But in the 80s, it's not a stretch to imagine that a lot of kids, this would be their first exposure to both India and China, and then that's that would be their impressions of it. So when I saw this in 1991, I was just thinking, it just made me think, was, was there any real portrayal of Asian people that I've seen so far that was actually any good? And it was really hard to come up with anything. Um, as, as Charlie said, there wasn't very much around at the no, time. No, so. not at all. And how about Vor? Um, so sorry, I actually come from a slightly different um, angle here, so I'm going to slightly not play by the rules. Sorry, Eugene. That's but okay. I, I also have to ask, were all of you guys born in the States? Yes. I was. Yes. I was born in Brooklyn. Ah, yeah. so I was not. Um, mm -hmm. So I have a very different experience, and I think um, at the top of the at the top of the show, you mentioned Radio Free Asia um, having a lot of our colleagues being Asian Americans or Asians living in America, and yeah. that was me. So, okay. so I don't. So I don't think. I mean, certainly as a child, um, that would not have been something I thought about. Similar to Charlie, like representation, right? And. For me, you know, I moved here in the 90s. My parents were graduate students. Uh, I lived in the South, just like Amy, um, in a part of the country where there weren't very many Asian people. 
and the ones who were Asian were folks who were similar to my parents, recently arrived, um, young professionals or graduate students. If there were any established Asian American communities, we weren't really a part of those. So, you know, this question of representation was never an issue because mm -hmm. we were foreigners. Like, why would there be any expectation of being, quote unquote, represented, right, in this media? It you know, it wouldn't have even crossed my mind. And um, I think for me, it's funny, even though I'm an American citizen, I'm clearly an Asian American now, I still find um, living in the U.S. is a bit of an anthropological experience, <laughs> perhaps <laughs> because, um, you know, I've, this is actually, I think, the first U.S. media organization I've ever actually worked for. So um, my mm -hmm. work experience has always been international. My um like familial experience has always been international. So this idea of there being a problem with representing an experience like mine um, isn't something that really <laughs> that that really crosses my mind. Um, and and then I know the rule was you're not supposed to reach into foreign media, but actually, like those kinds of stories mm. would have been the ones that actually did uh, represent quote unquote me. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, there were a few of them when I was growing up that made it into the mainstream and were quite well received. So um, when I was young, it was the Disney animated version of Mulan. I don't know if you guys remember yes, that. Yes, yes. I actually thought, I thought it was quite nice. It was like quite sensitively done and had a, a feminist message in a way that traditional tellings of Mulan that I had been actually, familiar with. That's my kind. only memory of Mulan as animated. Is there yeah. a non-animated version? Yes, there, there is no a non-animated version. Ah. It was very, it was panned. I've not seen nice. it, but apparently it was very bad. Um, and... Um, yeah, and uh, also, I don't know if you guys knew this, but uh, Mulan was voiced by um, a Me Broadway actress who... Leah Salonga? Yes. Is that Leah Salonga? And yes. I actually... No, no, wasn't, no? wasn't she voiced by Ming-Na Wen? Oh, maybe it was her singing. Sorry, maybe oh, she was a voice, yes, but her yes, singing okay, was okay. Uh, Leah Salonga, who I actually saw on Broadway um, doing Flower Drum Song, <laughs> which was um, which had been revived in, like, the 2000s. It was mm. quite good. Um, and then... Um, a bit later on, I was still pretty young, but uh, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, yes. Yes. which got yes. a lot yes. of accolades. And so, like, those would have been, even though that was foreign, it kind of penetrated mm -hmm. the U.S. mainstream. They, they were Hollywood films. They were Hollywood yeah. films. And yeah. Ang Lee was a very well-respected director. He had done Sense and Sensibility previously. Um, and then there was, I'm sorry, I'm just, like, droning on and on now. No, it's okay. Um, but I, I think, and this might have come out before... Um, but I saw it as a young person. I certainly read the novel as a young person. The Joy Luck Club, um, which I, you know, like, it's uh, like that. June is making a face. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I, I mean, like, look, I, I actually could not tell you what the plot was, but I just remember being actually rather impressed that there were these stories and okay. they existed and, like, I didn't see it as... Well, among the Asian-American activist community, the author of the Joy Luck Club book, Amy Tan, is seen as a very problematic figure for casting uh, all her male Asian characters as uh -huh. uh, like, e evil womanizers and, and things like that. And My um, only experience with yeah. Amy Tan, I haven't read her books, but whenever I'd write about, like, my mom or something for like English class, my teacher would be like, Oh, I love it. It's just like Amy Tan. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, but, but that movie, there were some good, good aspects of it, like how she captured like overbearing parents and uh, it, like the, the generational conflict yeah. was what the whole point of it was. Yeah. But it just, she seemed to like overgeneralize the. the but again, yeah. right, back then there were so few. Mm -hmm. So right. few kind of uh, content or books or right. films that right. would punch through, then they would become reference points. Yeah, because there was sure. nothing else for people to reference. Right, to. but see, the the thing with the Joy Luck Club is the people were holding it up here. Like, this is the Chinese American experience because right. it was the only thing that was out there. This book or this movie, yes. right? And so, so I think when we say we have a representation, quote unquote, problem, is that this there should be more and more diverse stories than just this one that everybody holds but, up on a pedestal. You know it. I guess that's what that's where it was starting. You know, mm -hmm. the representation. Yeah, you have to start somewhere. You got to start somewhere. Of course. Um, and I just wanted to comment that even though a bore has a different opinion, it's not any less valid than any of our opinions. No. And, and a lot of times, um, what people will do is whenever people raise an issue, when Asian Americans raise an issue, they'll go to people in Asia and say, like, "Well, these people didn't have a problem with it." Like, if you remember, um, 
the movie Ghost in the Shell, and that had uh, Scarlett Johansson, Scarlett Johansson playing a role that should have been an Asian woman if they're going off of the anime it was based on. And so, like, a lot of p- people in America were like, no, I watched that anime when I was growing up, and it was formative for me. How dare you cast a white actress in that role? And then they go to Japan and ask a few people there, like, well, how do you feel about Scarlett Johansson doing this role? And they're like, oh, it doesn't bother me. I think it's cool. It shows that we can, we can have diversity in our stories. And then they say, see, real Japanese people are not offended by this. So you people who aren't, e- aren't even Japanese or aren't even, quote unquote, really Asian are having a problem with it. Yeah, so yeah. I don't think that people should use the narrative of Asians not in the U.S. to discount the narrative of other Asians in the U.S. I mean, everybody's viewpoint is valid and, and has its own merit. I think. Yeah, no, I think also the question, like, so when I was preparing for this show, um, I think certainly this representation issue, it, I was thinking about it, it would certainly be much more relevant to like my kids, right, mm-hmm. who are definitely Asian American. Right. Uh, they were born here. And I think they would find it very strange to see the only example of Asianness is like Mr. Miyagi or whomever. Or Shorty. Yeah, or Shorty. Yeah, <laughs> that, Temple of Doom. Yeah, like, I, so, you know, so, so the question becomes much more relevant, I think, depending on what your actual experience and your identity as Asian American mm. or an Asian living in America or whatever it is, right? Yeah. Um, Bohr makes a good point. I mean, I think kids growing up today, they're they're growing up during a time where there is there's more diversity already as yeah. as mm-hmm. as a given. So they're not necessarily seeing that. Oh, I'm not seeing people who don't look like me in the movies or in school or whatnot. It just seems that now. 20 right. years later, yeah. you know, when, when our kids are growing up, it's, I've never been asked, you know, as my kids grew up, you know, a question about diversity or how, how come I don't look like everyone else. Uh, but I don't think the uh, ancient Chinese secret commercial would fly today. So. <laughs> right, that's exactly. <laughs> we need more Calgon. Ancient Chinese secret, huh? Like they would like see that. that and they would just be like, what is this about? <laughs> okay. This is very strange. All right, so let's get to the next part of this segment. Um, so we're going to have a little bit of the Asian character show and tell, and we'll each bring up two characters from our youths, except for Boar, who's not participating. Um, and we, the, we, we believe they're positive, or at least they're the least negative from our perspective. Um, so I'll go first, and I'll explain that the, the idea for this segment comes from a blog post I did a few years ago where I made a personal top 10 list. And I defined this, uh, my youth, as 1978 to the year 2000. And long story short, the characters I put at the top of the list in, in like, 10 through 5 they were like people who had very limited roles um i also put in there a white character played by a half asian actor with the caveat that i would only allow one of these characters because otherwise the whole list would be you know top 10 keanu reeves roles rather than asian american roles and then after that i had a few other characters that i that i liked but they had problems for one reason or another and that's where i included shorty he's like i think number five on my list Wait, but eugene can i ask you yeah, a question sure, sure does keanu reeves identify as being asian american i didn't know uh, well, that. I, I think he does um he's in a movie called always be my maybe with uh with ali wong yes and, I've and seen in it. that one uh he the press for that she said you know all the men in here are you know um, appe- he? appealing yeah. Asian American men. Well, so that uh, that film came out quite recently yes, on yes. Netflix. But like when he was doing Speed or yes, like yes. The Matrix, yeah. yes. you would not have ad- he would not have ad- the tagline for advertising those films would not have been well, appealing starting, Asian yeah, American. starring Sandra <laughs> yeah, Bullock so, I mean, back, and back an appealing the day, Asian American man. <laughs> back in the day, people used to we used to joke around that Keanu Reeves is the secret Asian yes. man. You know, I think I think people. I know for a fact, bringing up Keanu Reeves, you know, going back to Thailand for summers when those movies were out, I would see that he was huge, you know, because yeah. I because I think Asians identified with his features, maybe. He, he looked half Asian or something. I mean, but, it but wasn't they, a secret that he was mixed, but I mean, you know, definitely. Um, but it would not I, I have been I, a point of... Yeah, I think back in the 90s, he wasn't being like, oh, yeah, I'm, no, I'm representing true. Asian Americans. But now, if you ask him about it, I, I'm sure he doesn't deny it or anything. I think we should call his agent. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. <laughs> um, so my top two on the list were... Uh, first is Ensign Harry Kim from the TV series Star Trek Voyager, which aired from 1995 to 2001. And Harry Kim was just a guy who was part of the crew. There was basically nothing wrong with the character. He didn't have any stereotypes or anything like that. And, you know, Star Trek is supposed to be a post-racial future, so it wouldn't have been in place if they were to do anything like that anyway. It, it was a good role for him, and he just happened to be Asian. Yes, yes. Right? And it's it's played by, of course, um, Taiwanese-American actor Garrett Wong. And... Um, I guess, like, he's up on the list because it's just not a problematic role. 
and that's an exceptionally low bar. I don't know about the rest of you, but I didn't do all this work just to be stopped by a 0. .42 phase variance. All right, Mr. Kim, you've convinced me. Um, the, the second and the best role on my top ten list was uh, Rufio from the movie Hook. So Hook came out in 1991, and the premise is that Peter Pan has left Neverland and grown up and forgotten his past. And then Captain Hook has come to kidnap his kids, and so he has to go back to Neverland, relearn how to be Peter Pan again, and face off with Captain Hook. And Peter Pan was played by Robin Williams, and Hook, Captain Hook, is played by Dustin Hoffman. So who's Rufio in this one? Rufio is the leader of the Lost Boys in Peter Pan's absence. He's portrayed by Filipino-American Dante Bosco. And in this film, each Lost Boy is supposed to be specific to a, uh, the era that they were lost. So you've got kids dressed in 40s clothes and 50s clothes and 60s. So so Dante Bosco as Rufio is supposed to represent the 80s, and he has a you know spray-painted hair, hairdo, yeah. three mohawks, skater clothes and everything. And he, he's, he's just cool. And and I think this is the first time that I, I saw an, an Asian role where where the guy's just supposed to be cool and and he's undeniably yeah. cool and he's he was, like leader leader of all the boys and they all look up to him the ringleader he cool. is like the yeah, benchmark yeah. that adult peter is compared with to see if he's ready to to get back into the swing of things no no mr skunkhead with too much mood you are just a punk kid i want to speak to a grown up all grown ups are pirates excuse me we kill pirates i'm not a pirate so happens, I am a lawyer. Kill the lawyer! Kill the lawyer! I'm not that kind of lawyer. You've inspired yes. me to rewatch Hook because I definitely do not that remember that story you don't at all. Oh my God. <laughs> okay, it's a great movie. It's very underrated. It didn't really make that much money when it came out, but I still watch it from time to time. So next up, uh, Amy can introduce her two characters. All right. My first one comes from, I don't know if you've seen the 1997 version of Cinderella. It's called Rogers and Hammerstein Cinderella. Was this like a made-for-TV production? It was a live action with Whitney Houston as the fairy godmother, and uh-huh. then Brandy was Cinderella. I remember this Yeah, film. we I were made to film. watch this multiple times <laughs> in orchestra Wasn't, uh, class. Whoopi Goldberg was in that too, right? Yes. And, yeah. and Jason Alexander from Seinfeld? Yes. yes oh, yes, I didn't yes, know that. Yes. Oh, okay. But anyway, I wanted to nominate Prince Christopher or Prince Charming. Um, Ah. who's also played by Filipino-American Paolo Montalban. Um, And while he's, like, just the side character, you know, the love interest, he's, like, a great guy in the movie, right? He's, like, very dashing, like a gentleman, very down-to-earth, like a romantic, and all the girls are vying for his affection. And then his mother is played by Whoopi Goldberg, and his father is Victor Garber, which is also fun. Look, all I'm asking is that you let me choose a bride for myself, in my own way. I guess I have this silly idea that I want to be in love when I get married. Like you were. That's all we want for you too, son. Yes, darling. But there's nothing saying you can't fall in love with the ball. You haven't heard a word I've said. And then my second nominee would be Kelly Kapoor from The Office. Have any Mm. of you seen The Office? Yes. Yes. Uh, I was shocked when Eugene and Charlie both said they have not watched The Office. You guys haven't watched The Office? No, I watched the UK one more. Um... But I think I was out of the country. What what year did that show air? It's like the mid aughts, I would say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we were both out of the country at the time. I was a new so. pa- I was a new parent. I wasn't watching much TV. Yeah. I think so. maybe this is a very millennial thing. I, I just oh. assumed everybody had seen it, like Harry Potter, kind of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, actually, Amy, I'm really curious. I'm really curious as to why that's one of your picks yeah, yes. because, like, she's quite. So, for for those of you guys who haven't seen the show, when I watch it, my my memory of it is that she's like quite vapid yes for and sure. she's quite like vapid but also manipulative and materialistic and yeah. she's like, it's like a caricature of a valley girl but she's indian american yes <laughs> yes so so i'm very i'm very curious about this pick oh my god he is so cute would you talk to him for me and see if he likes me no i don't think i can oh please jim please please jim please 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 he's so cute i like him so much and i would do it but i'm too shy please jim please 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 jim please 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 well she's like for sure a controversial one um for many reasons including the ones you listed also because you know she's always throwing herself after her like white love interests the entire show um 
But I think she came at a time when Asian women and girls were portrayed as like these like quiet, nerdy outsiders, or you could be like the spunky sidekick with like the dyed like streak in your hair to oh, like right. the yeah. like white the male hair slash, hero. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And there was like nothing in between. So I just really enjoyed that you could be like vapid and like the office like gossip and like she plays that role so well. Yeah. And it's like it's totally <laughs> yeah. believable. And that's that's why I think it's... I'll, I'll confess I, I didn't watch much of The Office and when uh, Eugene had said Kelly Kapoor was on the list, I I it didn't click immediately. But when he sent the link of the of the compilation, you know I I. You know, I'm with Amy on this. She's she's uh, she just happens to be Indian American. Yeah, yeah. I like that her comedy was like because of her personality, not because she was like, oh, look, like a silly like Asian character right. who looks kind right. of ridiculous. Right. You know, she was very funny. Yeah, um, she was funny. And Mindy Kaling has gone on to do some like really great stuff. Um, and uh, like, yeah, I think like funny Asian women is definitely like a more recent phenomenon. In Shout out to Ellie Wong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, yes. In American media, and that's, that's that's actually funny that you. I forgot about Lucy Liu. I was a little young for, or like my English was not good enough for Ally McBeal, but um, Ally McBeal, excuse me. But it's funny. Um, I remember, oh, you know, some piece that I'd written a while ago. There was a study that um, American more Americans think that the English actress. Kate Winslet is American than they do like Lucy Liu oh who my. was oh. born in mm. <laughs> New York um, because like Asianness is something that you wear so clearly and a lot of Americans Americans writ large experience of Asian people tends to be of Asians as foreigners at least in, when I was young that was the case mm. so I sort of understand that right like if you're from Wyoming or you know somewhere where you don't have much yeah contact with other people who are Asian, you don't automatically assume that and, they're... And you will be asked, where, American. where are you Yes, from? I still get asked that all the time. From? I get asked that all the no, time. No, where are you really from? Where are you yeah. really from? <laughs> no, but again, that goes back into the reason why representation is important, because if you live in an area where there aren't a lot of Asians, your impression of Asians is going to be shaped by media. And in this case, you know, if you see the, what what we had when Charlie yeah. and I were growing up, then it's not a very good representation. Not, not much. I grew up, you know, I'm I'm an '80s kid. I grew up during the time of John Hughes movies. You know, oh you, yeah, Pretty in Pink, <laughs> Breakfast Club, and uh, and Sixteen Candles. Yeah, well, Sixteen Candles. <laughs> a lot there of you go. The famous, the famous Asian character from Sixteen Candles, Long Long Duck Dong, right? Do we have and, to censor that name? <laughs> and uh, what? Who was it? He was the exchange student, right? Yes. yes. So. You know, I I didn't see the movie at the time when it came out. I, I I watched it a few years later, but I'm I'm sure there were probably some references were made to me as Long Duck Dong, but you know, it it, it didn't bother me. It just kind of, kind of slid off me, and uh, and yeah, sadly during that time, that was the only Asian character that I would you know see in 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 pop culture. Um, mm-hmm. um, James Bond movies for me as a kid were important. In the in the sense, uh, important meaning it was okay. Uh, let me explain. It, it's like travel log, you know. You yeah, know, they were all kind of set in exotic places, and yes. you would get a bit of postcard of of where those uh, where those shoots were done. Sure, the characters were all all problematic, but at least it was you know for someone with a, a VCR at home, and or my dad would bring home the laser disc. It, oh, right. it, it would be an opportunity to kind of watch these locales one of them which was thailand you know they they did uh man with the golden gun which <laughs> that's which, the you know, most problematic i know, I know. Ever. It is problematic, it's between but... that and and um you only live twice where yes, james bond gets surgery to oh yes make i himself remember this japanese, i remember this and then he squints his eyes for the rest of the movie so that he looks japanese. problematic characters yeah. but again at that time as a kid growing up there wasn't much in pop culture that that even was set in Asia, so we got excited. My sister and I would get excited to just, oh wow, look, they shot this. Oh, they're they're kind of the extras are kind of speaking Thai, you know. So with with the <laughs> lack of characters, the two that I will mention are Pat Morita, of course, um, mm-hmm. because you know his role in Happy Days. He was Arnold, right? Um, yeah. He owned that restaurant that they all hung out in, and he wasn't a pushover. So to me, that kind of represented strength entrepreneurship mm-hmm. you know he owned a business and um and uh and, and later in the the karate kid movies which i which i think i was uh, a little older than and didn't, didn't really watch those movies again he had a, a position and a role of of strength fast to wash all the car 
den wax. What? Well, what do I have to watch? I, 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 I remember, dear. No question. Yeah, but I... Right. Wax on, right hand. Wax off, left hand. Wax on, wax off. But it, it, was, it was a stereotype. But another thing about Pat Morita that I wanted to say is that he didn't he didn't have an accent, but all the characters he had That's to right. play he he even, faked that accent. Yeah, even even Arnold and Happy Days, uh, he had to fake yeah. an accent, and and also like when he first got his his um his start in stand up comedy, he was billing himself not as Pat Morita but as the Hip Nip, right? So Ooh, ouch. so um ouch. I think the the era that he broke in the show business, you kind of had to do that in order to to get booked anywhere. So, uh, you know, again, me as a kid watching TV in the '80s, growing up, there wasn't there wasn't that much out there right. in terms of seeing any any Asian characters or or Asian locations. So mm. these these are the the ones I remember, and at least he wasn't he wasn't a pushover. The other character I wanted to mention, and um, and he wasn't a character because it was him, uh, yeah. is the show Yan Khan Cook. Um, Yan Ken Cook. Yan Ken Cook. <laughs> Yan Ken Cook. So yeah. I didn't watch it all the time, but it was on TV. You know, right. it was on PBS. Uh, so Mar- Martin Yan, right? Yes, Martin Yan. So he's actually Canadian, uh-huh. and I think he got his first show on the West Coast, and then I think it got picked up by 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 PBS. But you know, you can imagine that as a kid growing up in the '80s, you here's an Asian person running his own cooking show. Yeah, and you know, before that, you just. I watched Julia Child too. So, so then, <laughs> so wow. then, yeah, I, yeah, I watched TV at a weird time, like between four p.m. and six p.m. or something like that, uh-huh. like before before dinner, and then we had dinner, and then we went to do homework. But but these were kind of the shows that that would be on, you know. And not that I was always dutifully tuning into his show, but the fact that again, an Asian person running his own show. Um, and consistently would uh, have that tagline at the end of the show. What, what was it? If the next time, be your own best chef. And remember, if Yan can cook, so can you. Zai Jian. If Yan can cook, you can too. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> um, no, I used to watch this show a lot uh, whenever I'd have a sick day from school because it was on PBS in the daytime. Uh, I guess it was yes. marketed at people who stay home from work and take care of the house and so like he'd teach you how to make all these different chinese things with ingredients in your home and it was pretty good i mean hmm. i think it's interesting because i can't think of any asian americans who have their own cooking shows or like are on tv cooking even today like today maybe Padma Lakshmi. she was oh, uh, yes, yeah yes, she had hosted yes, yes. Shop Shop. um Charlie, but i think before the show we were talking a little bit about james bond films and i, yes. I, I was saying i seem to remember that Michelle Yeoh was probably oh, the yes. least problematic yes. Bond yes. girl. <laughs> but she still had to have the obligatory though she did, session yes, at though, the end. though she did kiss Pierce Brosnan at the end. <laughs> but, like, you know, like, yeah, like, she was another one who was just, like, a... She wasn't just a Bond girl. I mean, yeah, she, she, she was, was an a agent. Spy. She I mean, had she, her own... She kicked ass also. Yeah, so, that, so, like, you know, that's not necessarily... It's not necessarily yeah. a bad Strange. thing that, if that was you the know first, Kung Fu. That was the first time uh, movie of hers that I that I saw, actually, and I thought she was a really good character. But um, Yeah, anyway, uh, so let's get on to the final top five list since Boer is not entering. Uh, before we do that, though, I want to give an honorable mention to Trini Kwan, the Yellow Power Ranger, which was played by the late Toy Trong. So Trini represents what may be the first recurring Asian character in a U.S. show aimed at kids. Um, so many Asian American women who are slightly younger than me said it was uh, the first moment they saw someone who looked like them in a heroic role, and they looked up to her. And so if you were on the internet in uh, the early, uh, the late 90s or early 2000s, there were plenty of GeoCities websites that uh, people would make that would be shrines to, to Trini Kwan. And, uh, I was not aware of that. The Yellow Ranger. Yeah, yeah, she, she was the yellow saber tooth tiger. It's Saber Tooth Tiger. Saber Tooth Tiger. It's more Come time. on, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe. It. See, I, see that that speaks to look, you then, right? When... I I didn't even remember this character until I saw it in the <laughs> scripts. Um, mm-hmm. So I guess it's a top five list, but the person who got the least votes, um, so we'll say he. DNF or did not finish or disqualified is unfortunately Prince, Christo- Prince Christopher with an average ranking of four. That's fair. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I I put him at four because the character did not resonate with me, and I probably didn't even see that that 
he just version. really exists to be dashing and okay. you know the object da- of dashing yes, he was he dashing is the Ken to Brandy's yes, Barbie he's just okay. Prince Charming in fifth place was uh, Mr. Miyagi or Arnold played by Pat Morita he has an average score of three um, I expected him to be higher but that's where he is yeah I was talking to Eugene about him and had just how his character didn't really resonate with me but it probably would have with like my parents so to speak just yeah. more like that quiet strength or like kind of just like being able to like um i guess like swallow whatever like comes your way is more of like a first gen immigrant feeling to me mm-hmm. than yeah. so like yeah. a second one all right in fourth place it was martin yan with an average score of 2.5 um you know i like that show and i think this is this is the right place for him yeah all right <clears throat> okay in third place harry kim with an average score of two so it's interesting that um, Charlie said that this was his favorite character in there. I uh, did? Yeah. Oh, from that list you gave me. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I didn't watch the show. Uh-huh. I didn't watch the show. I, I did watch two clips that you shared with me. And, okay. and the thing that struck me was he, he was a good character that happened to be Asian. And, okay. And, you know, the same thing with uh, Kelly Kapoor from The Office. You know, same thing. You know, good different type of good character mm-hmm. who just happened to be asian and i think i think uh i think that star trek character so I, I'm, I'm curious that. why you ranked him higher than kelly though i did yes <laughs> uh probably more relatable oh, okay yeah okay i saw it as as more 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 a more relatable character but 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 kelly kelly was memorable kelly had strength and uh Poker mind, okay. You know. Now we're at the top two slots, so I have to say number one first, but that doesn't mean we're not going to talk about the guy at number two. Uh, oh. the, the person at number two. <laughs> okay. Uh, number one was uh, Kelly Kapoor with a average score of 1.5. I said this was the best one out of the list of your four characters, and uh, Charlie said it was second. Wow. So. So uh, that's the most popular. I, I like this character a lot based on the best of clips because it just it seemed very believable. And I'm yeah. like, I, everybody feels like if you, I think I think everybody knows somebody that's like that, right? Yes. So yes. it's just very really believable. And then finally, uh, in second place is Rufio, who also tied with Harry Kim with a average score of 2.0. But I decided that he gets this number two spot and number three because they're both my characters. And, <laughs> and he placed higher on my individual list. So, but anyway, yes. Um, so that's our top five list. Now I want to close this segment with the question: Is it getting better? And if yes, when did you first notice that it was? To or, your question, I'd say yes. Um, I think yes, time. It's okay. Yes, time has kind of proven that media with Asian leads is commercially successful. So you have like crazy rich Asians, um, everything, everywhere, all at once. Um, to all the boys I've loved before. Mm-hmm. Um, so I see way more Asian faces in entertainment than I did as a kid, but I also think the goalposts for good representation um, will keep moving forward with time as well. So, like, for example, I found stories that were very uniquely Asian-American, like The Farewell or Minari, to be way more meaningful than just, like, an Asian face in a yeah. TV show or a movie. Yeah. I'll say that, yes, it is getting better, and I think the first time I thought that was when I saw the film uh, Harold and Kumar go to White Castle in 2004. (laughs) And the two of them, uh, Cal Penn and John Cho, play Harold and Kumar. They're they're just two regular guys, but at the same time, it's not like that they wrote the role for some white people and then just hired Asian actors for it. Their ethnicity is actually part of it, but they're not beating you over the head with any social message or anything. I, I actually think the strength of that movie is that they kind of lean into it and make fun of all the Asian tropes. That's and true I, too. I, I actually think that's where the the improvement I or like improvement or whatever. Like that's the thing that I think is is really a notable. Um, we were talking about comedy earlier. Yeah, I, um, I, I, I a totally notable agree with change, you. right? Yeah. Because in the in the film, I I don't know if you guys have seen it. Um, John Cho's character, who's Asian, is like being pushed to find like an Asian partner <laughs> and like make a ton of money and mm. he hates he has his office job and he hates it and then um cal penn's character is i think indian american and then he's like being pushed to be a doctor and he doesn't want to but he has these like secret doctor ability and it's quite funny and i think that's like the thing for me that sorry i no, no it's okay <laughs> um, I, i'm probably no, speaking it's... up before i'm supposed to um but i think the thing that's really changed like even in the last few years is uh i don't know we're all just kind of like leaning into some of the right. stuff and yeah. being able to laugh at ourselves about it and that's yeah. 
really different. Like, it takes a very long time to get to that, I think. Um, Comedy helps a lot. It really does, you know? yeah. Um, people come in to change, maybe, with if, if you can make folks laugh and you can poke fun at yourselves and poke fun at the real issues, I guess. Yeah. Then people start getting a little more comfortable and, yeah. and more accustomed. But to... regarding that movie specifically, though, like, I... Yes, they did put all those things in there, but I felt like it was just it just naturally fit and it was relatable rather than, hey, we're going to make a movie about um, how Asians were discriminated against and let's hit this point and this point and this point and this point and, you know, kind of beat you over the head with, with there's something wrong and we've got to fix it and this movie is going to fix it. And that's not what it felt like at all. It was right. a comedy. It was enjoyable. And if, if you were seeing it and you weren't Asian American, maybe you wouldn't be able to necessarily relate to the things that they dropped in there. But if you were, that's like a subtle reach out to you that says, like, hey, I see you. It's a little, it's a little inside acknowledgement right? yeah, yeah, of yeah. The, shared, right. the shared experience. Hey, everyone. Eugene here. This episode went on very, very, very long. And rather than sit around and try to fit an hour and a half of recording into just around 30 minutes and lose a lot of valuable conversation, we decided it would be better to split this episode in half and publish it as two episodes. So this episode that you've listened to just now is 7A, and the second half of this episode will come out in a week, and then the following week we will return with episode 8. So I hope you enjoyed our discussion on Asian American representation and had fun reminiscing about some of our favorite characters when we were growing up. For Amy Lee, Boer Dang, and Charlie Darapak, I'm Eugene Huang, and we will see you all very soon. <laughs>